In order to reduce the amount of reloading required in the heat of battle, we wanted players to be able to upgrade the pistol by increasing its ammo capacity. And that might seem like a small change, but implementing it in a way that was intuitive to players and that didn't have a lot of negative side effects was surprisingly tricky to get right. Our initial mechanic for increasing the ammo capacity was to use double-sized clips. Once the pistol was upgraded, the player's backpack held clips with twice as many bullets, and those were represented by a clip model that was twice as long. But unfortunately, the longer clips presented a lot of distracting fictional problems. For one, they looked ridiculous protruding out of the bottom of the pistol. Players were also left wondering what was going on in their backpack to transform the single-capacity clips that they put in there into the double-capacity versions that they were pulling out. We were also left with the sort of absurd implication that the pistol clips found in the world now magically all had to be the upgraded double-sized versions. And while we did scrap the double-sized clips, the concept was still enticing. We just needed to find a better metaphor. So then we started looking at the hoppers that were used on paintball guns that could store large amounts of paintballs. In fact, the final upgrade that resulted from this whole line of thinking is still internally referred to as the bullet hopper. So with this in mind, we next needed to design an intuitive interaction model. Players were already satisfied with our existing pistol interaction loop, which was eject clip, insert the next one, chamber, and then shoot. So we wanted to preserve these skills that players were already beginning to master. So players would still reload the gun as before, but small mechanical prongs would steal bullets from the inserted clip, pull them into the hopper, and then place them into the firing chamber as needed. Audio cues were also added to clearly communicate the state of the hopper loading process. The hopper also impacted the visual design that we used to convey the state of the pistol. Originally, the clips themselves had a numerical counter indicating the number of bullets remaining. And on its own, this was fine, and players understood it easily. But the readout on the bullet hopper was on the opposite side of the pistol, and had a pattern of blue dots indicating the amount of bullets remaining. So these two representations in two different locations made it difficult for players to quickly determine the total number of bullets in the upgraded gun. To solve this, we designed a single visual readout on the side of the pistol grip. It structurally matched the state of a pistol clip, the pistol's bullet chamber, and the bullet hopper if the upgrade was acquired. For Half-Life Alex, we wanted to expand the functionality of our soundscape system, which is used to play ambient sounds. In prior games, we could generally only play one soundscape at a time. The player would be hearing either soundscape A or soundscape B, with a brief crossfade from one to the other. In this game, the soundscapes are much more flexible and can be overlapped in ways that enable more realistic transitions. For example, the volume of different soundscapes can be controlled by the player's position and the open or closed state of particular doors in the world. We frequently use this functionality in areas like this transition between indoor and outdoor spaces. If you pause outside for a moment, you'll notice the crickets, birds, distant dog barks, and other environmental sounds that help paint the picture of the quarantine zone late in the day. As you move into the indoor area, you'll notice the outdoor soundscape diminish as you move away from the door. In fact, if you close the door, the volume of the outdoor soundscape is reduced even further. And as you progress into the building, you'll begin to notice the indoor soundscape consisting of the indistinct hum of machinery and buzz of electrical fixtures. generally a requirement that all new enemy types have a section of the game designed to introduce them. We rarely build the introduction early on in the process though, because it's often through playtesting that we learn exactly what aspects of the new enemy need to be highlighted in the introduction. In addition to understanding the capabilities of a new enemy, we also find introductions help solidify the very existence of the new enemy type in the player's mind. Without an explicit introduction, we sometimes find that playtesters confuse multiple enemy types, conflating them in their minds. This was the case with the Suppressor, the class of soldier that's designed to pin a player behind cover while other soldiers advance on them. The Suppressor is an inversion of the previous soldier classes, who've all focused on trying to push players out of cover. The Suppressor introduction stretches across the next two rooms. In the first, players see the Suppressor firing at zombies, giving the player a moment to safely observe its firing behavior. 
they also get to hear its associated sounds, which are important to learn for future encounters. In the second room, players learn to fight the suppressor themselves. This is relatively straightforward when the suppressor is alone, but will become more involved in later arenas where we combine the suppressor with other soldier types. It isn't practical to spend development time or art resources evenly across every part of the game, so we rely on strategic reuse of resources to maintain fidelity and specificity across the game's environments. This space was initially constructed using industrial models and textures seen throughout many previous environments. To set it apart, we added the large cables and vortigaunt pods to imply a makeshift combine power plant whose purpose was to transmit energy to the substations. The juxtaposition of this abandoned industrial space with the large combine cables created enough visual interest to make the space feel meaningful at a relatively low cost. The cable motif was subsequently added to other parts of the game to increase visual interest and give the player a sense of being led toward the vault. It may not be obvious, but the cables exiting through the ceiling here continue on to the exterior of the building, across the large construction courtyard, and over the roof of the distillery building, presumably continuing on to a substation or other combine infrastructure. Players may not notice that continuation, but such details help guide us in building a world that feels connected and consistent. One problem we faced with the VR movement styles that Alex supported was keeping the combat experience from diverging based upon whether players were using teleport or continuous movement. If the combat was significantly different depending on the player's movement setting, our playtesting requirements could explode combinatorially. One way that we prevented this combinatorial explosion was by ensuring that AIs could sense player movement no matter which locomotion style the player was using. To do this, we created a visual proxy for players using teleport locomotion. Imagine a scenario where the player is behind cover, hidden from a soldier's sight. If the player used continuous movement to run to another piece of nearby cover, the soldier would see them while they were out in the open. But a player who instantly teleported from one piece of cover to the next would not be seen. To solve this discrepancy, when a player teleports, we leave a breadcrumb trail of invisible visual proxies, which the enemy AI can see. These proxies pass information to the AI similar to what it would have gathered from seeing the player perform the movement directly. In this case, the soldier would know the teleporting player had left the original cover and run across open ground to the new cover, just like a player using continuous motion. While obviously not identical, in that the soldier didn't have a chance to take a shot at the teleporting player, these kinds of features did allow us to reduce the number of ways our AI logic needed to take player movement options into consideration. For our teleport and continuous locomotion modes, we provide corresponding ladder climbing methods. By default, player using teleport locomotion can target a ladder and after a short timer, get teleported to the top or the bottom, depending on where they started. The timer was necessary to ensure that players were intentionally using the ladder. We didn't want them to unintentionally target the ladder and become disoriented when they found themselves at the other hand. Players using continuous locomotion can directly grab ladders to climb up or down. In this mode, they can grab a ladder rung and move their hand down to raise their body or move their hand up to lower it. This allows players to move up or down the ladder rung by rung in a natural way. This mode turned out to be so popular that we added it as an option even for players using teleport locomotion. As it happens, most of the ladders in our game do not extend very far beyond the upper landing area. This made dismounting the top of a ladder challenging for players using continuous ladder climbing since there's very little ladder to grab onto above the landing area. To solve this, we detect when the player stop holding the ladder with both hands and automatically teleport them to either the top or the bottom based on the direction they were climbing. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of explicit ladder training in the game. So some players are surprised by this teleport behavior if they accidentally let go with both hands while climbing. Nevertheless, this was a better alternative to leaving the players hanging or forcing them to fall down if they let go with both hands, especially since some of our ladders are rather long and it would be tedious to have to reclimb just because a player happened to let go shortly before reaching the top. 